coming to you from Yale University, where I'm, I'm a professor of mathematics and I'm the dean of science. Uh, so just started, actually, it's a new position. And, but I'm also involved in the, the effort to build um, infrastructure and resources and our new science priorities around big data uh, and its mathematical foundations. And one of the things that uh, we're particularly interested in is in how tools of big data, some of which we were just hearing about, very interestingly, um, play a role in hard science. Uh, and how we, how we as researchers, engineers, and scientists confront the, the challenge of the successful and principled integration of, of tools of inference, as we see coming from uh, remarkable tools of inference, um, from, often from the private sector, into our work in the sciences. So there are two pictures here, one from my sort of life as a mathematician in hyperbolic geometry, and the other from some of the data science work I've been involved with, and some of what I want to do is sort of draw a contrast between these two. So whether we're doing stochastic gradient descent or some other kind of algorithm, tools of data analysis tend to revolve around the idea of maximizing some objective function, whether it's ad revenue or improving traffic flow, or just getting you from point A to point B, um, or the successful recognition of what you say into your cell phone. Um, and I think that it's fair to say that many of these efforts were kind of frustrated. Even, you know, I remember hearing in my own years in grad school, um, back in, God knows, uh, the 90s, about the idea of a neural network and how it might be computationally interesting to consider such a such a construction. Um, but somehow the word on the street, at least in the math community, was that this wasn't really going anywhere, and you know that that we weren't really going to be able to do much with these things. They were more curiosity or a fantasy of some sort of metaphorical imagination that if we designed a computer to work like the brain, maybe we'd get interesting results. Ha ha ha. Okay, so fast forward and, um, you know, as of about five years ago, I think, or maybe it was happening in certain circles earlier, the, the consensus seems to be that there was some kind of inflection point in the efficacy of the, maybe it's the, the number of layers, maybe it's the computational power, maybe it's the size or a variety of training data and how well these methods were working. Um, and yet, we're sort of not entirely sure how this happened or why. I mean, there are various theories that have been posited, but mathematics has suddenly become very preoccupied with the question of what is the right theory to model the success of deep learning methods. Um, and, and the success, I think, seconds the question of, you know, are we now in a, in a regime where we can, I mean, this is a somewhat rhetorical question, especially coming from someone who holds the title Dean of Science. Can, can, we, can we imagine that somehow all science is now conceivably data-driven? That if we simply collect enough data that, and throw it at any scientific question, that it can be answered with the application of, of algorithms. And, and this gets to an old debate, and it's something that I just feel like would be useful to tease out in this room with this community, uh, because I think that better industry-university collaboration will be part of how we move past this. This is sort of the idea of radical imperial, empiricism, that you could solve all problems with enough data, versus rationalism, which is you know, sort of more the idea that just by thinking hard enough about a problem that you will ultimately arrive at the solution regardless of how much information <laughs> you have to, to bring to bear on it. Hope, you know, this is, this, there's a beautiful metaphor which is kind of the, the ant which just uses the available tools to solve the problem in front of it versus the spider which uses its own webs to spin more and more complicated self-referential, this is, you know, resonant to me, the pure mathematician. And maybe it's the bee in the middle that, that actually takes, synthesizes, 
tools and synthesizes the information it brings back to the to the hive and produces something um, sweet. So, so what I would like to suggest, though, is that still we are at at a place in the development of this theory where the tools of big data, machine learning, and what have you, are not really designed to reproduce the structural elements of the scientific system. And so by, by the term model-driven uh, discovery, what I mean to propose is the idea that, that some sort of dynamic feedback loop between having a principled model for the dynamical system that is producing the data uh, tied together with these incredibly powerful inferential tools is a new sort of paradigm that, that we need to work toward. I mean, it's not as if I made it up, but um, that's what I think. I think that science needs to embrace this as the way to, to work with uh, big data tools. So, so the question arises, is there, a, is there a way that the tools of big data and machine learning can be designed to discover the inherent or latent variables governing a kind of dynamical system. Um, and so one can imagine, could, you know, could, could just from observed data, say a video of a ball bouncing, if you apply you know, Google's deep learning systems to this video, can it infer Newton's gravitational loss from, from the behavior of the ball as it bounces along. Not just the behavior of the ball, because that already assumes that I've extracted out that there is a ball and that it is bouncing. So if you simply have the video data, can, these, can somehow the, the algorithms yield a scientific model for, for what's happening in the picture? So what I'd like to suggest, I guess, is you know, this is being seen as a priority in various funding agencies, uh, the NSF in particular, and, and I think the time is right um, for us to try to bridge across to open source software in particular because science like this has to be done in the open and it needs to be interrogated by multiple points of view. Um, the only plug I'm going to make for my home turf university is that this is this idea of integrative data science that pulls data from around the, the university campus uh, and its mathematical foundations, um, you know, harnessing our traditions in applied mathematics, is our top priority for our science priorities, which were recently released. So feel free to ask me about this later if you like. So this is an example of a chaotic set in the in the plane. This is somehow trying to bridge my prehistory and the current state. Um, it has what's called Hausdorff dimension between one and two, so it's what we call a fractal. Now, why am I showing you this? Well, if you think about chaotic dynamical systems, that's a classic example of a, set of a system with simple rules that produces very complex behavior that's difficult to model on its own. So, so this is the, uh, the, ob the sort of simple system that this comes from. This doesn't look very simple, but in fact, what these are are two-dimensional hyperbolic planes, even though they look round, this sort of planar and with, res with respect to a certain metric, bent at a consistent angle along a predetermined pattern that's determined by topology. Now, the only parameter in this system is the angle of bending. Okay, so, so I'm just varying an angle, which is the angle of intersection, and then the rule tells me how to continue to bend this system. And as, as the uh, picture progresses, what you see is incredibly complex behavior from a very simple rule. So in the context of something like a dimension reduction algorithm, right, this is a one-dimensional system. And yet, if you were just looking, if you are just trying to capture the fractal and try to model it using machine learning, I would posit that the likelihood that this algorithm is going to extract the one-dimensional nature of this dynamics is very unlikely. And yet, there it is. And many other, you know, if you take things like the, the popular Mandelbrot set, which is 
but it can be defined by very simple rules and produces incredibly chaotic behavior. By contrast, you know, this is a um, kind of a graphical representation of a study of CT scans of traumatic brain injury patients and the, the CTs that, so, so the dots represent patient clusters, the red ones correspond to traumatic lesions and the, the green ones are not. And this was learned by just taking 200 scans and circling the lesions and just saying, okay, find things that look like this to a principal component analysis on the one hand, and then we also used a deep neural network. The PCA algorithm was a little bit better, it turned out. So, there's, so there is some system, though, underlying this, and the system is that we believe that when we see a scan, or a radiologist believes from lots of experience, and if we see a scan with a big dark blob in the middle of it, that that person needs to go to the OR right away. So we tag the data, and the algorithm can reproduce that model. Um, so this is another example, even though it's a very chaotic system, we don't understand exactly what the mechanism by which traumatic brain injury impacts the health of the patient, right? We know from experience, we have a model for, for what we should do. Um, so the next few slides are kind of cautionary though. So if we don't have a good model and we just release, I mean, many of you have probably seen this picture, if we don't have a model for the difference between a chihuahua and a blueberry muffin, um, the, the image the images themselves don't provide a very good or robust way of distinguishing them. I mean, you could try to tag images for, you know, <clears throat> whether they bark or, or whether they have little, you know, muffin tins uh, surrounding them. But, <coughs> excuse me, the algorithms themselves don't provide that scientific information for you. Um, similarly, all over the place, the sort of embrace of machine learning and big data algorithms uh, as shortcuts or as efficiency boosters of one sort or another are kind of increasingly being called into question, both for their potential for embedded bias behind the black box of an algorithm. There's a lot of press on this kind of thing. And, and the LAPD recently, after kind of being heralded as going big tech and trying to improve their crime fighting statistics by embracing big data realized that they were embedding certain racial biases into the algorithms that they were using from the data that they were training. So they've abandoned it, at least until a more principled approach can be arrived at. And then of course there's the question of whether the model that's being used to train the system is overly simplistic. So one I think could fairly convincingly argue that Yes, there's a model for how self-driving cars should drive themselves, right? They should try to avoid hitting the cars in front of them and they should obey traffic rules and stay within the speed limit and in the lanes and everything else. That's a, that's a model for the behavior of a self-driving car. But that model does not account for the latent variables that come from bad actors or potentially emergency vehicles or pedestrians or you know, there's a lot to account for, and of course, um, the entire CMU robotics team is now working at Uber trying to solve this problem. Um, so let me let me just sort of wrap up with with some more kind of points of principle that that I feel like I, I would like to think that this could just generate a conversation between those of us in academia and those of us uh, working in open source in particular, uh, as far as science is concerned. So, so we, we have this issue of black boxes hiding bias, but we also have the issue that massive data sets are all around us in academia, whether it's bioinformatic, genomic, medical images, uh, but this also includes things where the scientific model could be posited but has yet to be found. Okay, so this is increasingly true in things like climate modeling or physics or like with the Large Hadron Collider, they, the discovery of the Higgs boson wasn't just from a big data sort on the Large Hadron Collider, it was bringing decades of theory to the question of the data analysis. Um, so 
So the, the, the thing that I think confronts us in the academy is as these tools enter the scientific laboratory, mo quite frequently in an ad hoc way, when someone pulls, downloads an R algorithm, and in fact I've seen this with one of our PIs looking at low gravity experiments where he took the data, rendered it as an image, and applied TensorFlow's image <laughs> analysis to these images and got better results than he was getting with his current methodology. Okay, so, so that kind of tantalizing success suggests that we have a big problem to solve here and that our PIs aren't gonna wait around for us to tell them when they have the green light to, to use these techniques. Um, so how do we make the application of these tools principled, reproducible, reliable, and hopefully transparent and open to the scientific community? So that gets to the question of cloud storage and uh, you know, the, the, the temptation of using Amazon's um, services versus, say, Red Hat's or the mass open cloud. I would try to argue that keeping things out of the open to the extent we can is to our benefit. So I think that these really are challenges for the future of scientific research. It's not, by the way, that the tools from data science um, don't have their own scientific interests inherent in them. So to the extent we can train mathematical tools to, to discover latent um, smooth variables, say, you know, Find or discovering a manifold on which these gradients are descending, things of this nature, that is, is, is valuable in and of itself. Um, but again, things like, if you take the example of the, of the way we predict the weather, it's not by taking you know, the weather as it occurred on May 6th for the last 100 years and taking some kind of weighted average of that. It's actually by taking you know, 10 kilometer cubes and applying the Navier-Stokes equations to the, the fluid properties that, that exist in, in this, and we get much better results by actually using predictive modeling than by simply doing a data search. Um, but I, I, I guess on the, on the flip side, just to sort of complicate my own argument here, what of the fact that there are now algorithms that can beat the world Go champion? What can we learn from these? So there's a great YouTube video about this event when, when Kijia was first beaten by AlphaGo, and you get to move 37 in the match, and the computer does something that no one recognizes as a reasonable move. It's somewhere in the middle of the board, out in kind of this totally unexplored territory. And at that point, he gets up and walks out of the room and sort of is holding his head and trying to figure out what on earth just happened. And then it takes, you know, 10, 20 moves beyond that to finally see what the computer was doing. So I like to think of this as a hopeful example in the face of all of the sort of concerns about privacy and security, um, that actually the computers are telling us something and that we can learn something about our scientific models if we can actually get them to help us learn more about them. Um, so our work at Yale is partly about this, it's partly about trying to bridge the gap between neuroscientific methods and data science methods in terms of how the brain functions. That's another area of research that, that we're excited about, um, which I'd be happy to talk to you about. Uh, in general, I would say the need for open source and open science is just increasingly vital. Um, and the NSF and DOE are, are recognizing this and recognizing the kind of disruption that's upon us in terms of the scientific method more generally. Uh, we at Yale, at any rate, and I think across the community, believe that new mathematics, a new kind of calculus of data, is going to be required to really have a fully principled understanding and sort of a, a sort of new Newtonian revolution may be upon us. But I think that the, the world of industry is out ahead of us in some ways, and we're now kind of becoming the spiders off in our webs. So um, 
I'm very excited and interested in trying to develop further collaboration between what we're doing in data science at Yale, and we're also engaged with other university communities. Uh, and I think the, the Red Hat BU model is a particularly exciting one um, that we'd be interested in exploring. So thank you for your